Hi, this is Paul Muldoon, and it's a privilege to be with you this afternoon, or morning as it is for me. I'm at the moment in uh, New York State, this part of the world where I spend a lot of my time, has quite a large Amish community, <clears throat> the um, Anabaptist um, sect. Uh, they broke away at one point from the Mennonites, um, both of them coming from uh, Germany uh, to this part of the world. And they live in uh, the way their <coughs> ancestors lived um, for hundreds of years. So they still work with horses, for example, and uh, that's referred to at, uh, the, at the end of the poem, uh, an image of three horses uh, attached to a plow. So anyway, it's called an item. Again, I find myself at a party in that big windowed room overlooking a kitchen midden alongside my wife and a woman with whom I had once been smitten. I'd remembered her as Faith. Now she went by Hope. Lovely Rita, Hope was saying, is a semitone higher because the tape was speeded up. Aren't we just a little too far inland to be eating steamers? There's a case for calling a prenup a postnup. It's the same route to stem to stammer. They're both Anabaptist sects. It goes back to some schism. Our biggest problem is we're no longer customers viewing the world through the prism of the mine or the steel mill. This is an entirely new mode of post-industrial capitalism in which we ourselves are the commodity. It was with a sense of deja vu we watched the live stream from beyond the window, of that Amish plowman who'd stopped unpicking a furrow seam to realign the harness pads, collars, and hems of his three abreast team. The hems, of course, as many of you will know, the wooden um, uh, component of the horse's collar, two, two pieces of uh, bent wood that uh, go around the collar. I'll read a poem um, actually now from uh, the last book I published, which was called Frolic and Detour. And it's a little horsey poem also. And it's a poem about one of my very first memories. In fact, my first memory. Uh, I was brought up in uh, county, first few years in, of my life in County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. And uh, this was just after the Second World War, of course, there were still quite a few horses to be found. Partly, of course, because <clears throat> during the war itself, petrol had been rationed. And so that uh, the horse had made something of a comeback and was used for uh, various uh, agriculture activities and general, uh, general work. So this is a poem uh, <clears throat> called The Great Horse of the World. I use the word stale here, stale. It's a technical, it's a term for urinate. I hope it's not too early in the day for you there for me to start talking about urination. Anyway, The Great Horse of the World. The first thing I remember is being stepped on by a horse while it paused to stale, paying me no more heed than it would an upset pail of water or feed or a comb dragged through the coarse hair of its mane and tail. The great horse of the world stamps and champs at the bit and lays back one ear as I approach from the rear to hitch it 
to the world coach. Mindful of keeping at least one hand on it so it knows I'm still here. And those of you who have spent time with horses will know that it's always a good idea to let a horse know that you're, you're in the vicinity. Um, otherwise, he, she, it, or they might uh, kick you. So um, I read a poem um, set um, at this time of year. <clears throat> it's set actually on May 20th. Um, a few years back, 20, 21 years back, actually, around about the time of the birth of my son. And um, 20 years ago, for sure, um, you could pretty much set your clock by the fact that more or less, uh, almost, almost exactly on that date every year, um, the red knots, a type of bird, of course, um, would land on the shores of Delaware Bay. And uh, as I describe in the poem, they would um, feed there on the horseshoe crabs that had lumbered up onto the bay. Just one of those wonderful um, um, moments in nature when, of course, the timing of one event is, depends very much on the other. I, I suspect that even in the 20 years that have pa uh, passed since then, that um, something of that um, ability to, um, you know, set one's clock by it may have gone, because as you know, the the rhythms of the world and the uh, the various systems of the world have changed dramatically even over those past 20 years. But in any case, I'll, I'll read this poem. It's a very um, straightforward uh, poem, just a quick description of, of, uh, of um, an event. Red Knots. The day our sun is due is the very day the Red Knots are meant to touch down on their long haul from Chile to the Arctic Circle, where they'll nest on the tundra within a few feet of where they were hatched. 40 or 50,000 of them are meant to drop in along Delaware Bay. They time their arrival on these shores to coincide with the horseshoe crabs laying their eggs in the sand. Smallish birds to begin with. The red knots have now lost half their weight. Eating the eggs of the horseshoe crabs is what gives them the strength to go on. 40 or 50,000 of them getting up all at once, as if for a rock concert encore. Well, I mentioned Chile in that poem, and uh, I hope you don't mind. I'm kind of making this up as I go along, and I tend to do that with my readings because it keeps me present, and I hope will keep you present too. Um, so I published a book a few years ago called The Annals of Chile, um, I published a book a few years ago called Mules, and um, indeed, um, <laughs> um, when it was published in the US, a disgruntled customer wrote to the publisher uh, and said, I bought this book, Mules, and I, I discover that it has absolutely nothing to do with mules whatsoever. And I think the same might well have been said of the, this book, The Annals of Chile. didn't have a whole lot to do with Chile, but there is a poem in which um, one of the, uh, the, the Chilean, uh, Chilean uh, heroes, Bernardo O'Higgins, there were two O'Higgins in, in Chile, a, a father and son, 
who took, uh, who played a huge role in the uh, liberation of Chile. And needless to say, if they're called O'Higgins, they're probably a couple of Irish fellows for the most part. So anyway... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.